Noah Donahue's tragic case is a very serious case with serious implications. When Noah's case is discussed, it causes heated discussions. People feel strongly about many aspects of what we are going to discuss today. People want answers, but others don't want it discussed at all. This can result in extremely passionate and heated discussions, which, although understandable, go against YouTube policy. So although I absolutely encourage healthy discussion in the comments, please remember to keep it civil. If you've landed here and you haven't seen part one, you'll need to go watch that first or you won't know what we're talking about in this episode. You also need to understand who Noah is, his character. It's hugely relevant considering the narrative that's being pushed. Part one will be linked in the description. Because Noah's case is ongoing, there are people who I can't name here. Also, there's information out there which I won't be covering today because I couldn't find a credible source to back it up or it appeared to only be hearsay and I like to be able to back up everything I say. We will be discussing information received from witnesses, tip lines etc together with what we already have from captured CCTV footage and security footage and more. We will not be discussing theories which have no basis. We will also look at the mental health aspect and the suicide theory. We have a wide reaching audience on this channel. So to ensure that there's a basic understanding to what we need to discuss in Noah's case, allow me to give you some context. Most people have heard of the troubles when it comes to Northern Ireland. For those who may not know, a very broad, brief explanation. The troubles refer to a period of violent conflict from the late 1960s to the 1990s in Northern Ireland with spillover into England. This conflict arose after Ireland became independent from British rule, forming the Republic of Ireland, while Northern Ireland remained part of the United Kingdom. The violence involved two main groups, nationalists, mostly Catholics, who wanted Northern Ireland to unite with the Republic of Ireland, and unionists or loyalists, mostly Protestants, who wanted Northern Ireland to stay part of the UK. Paramilitary groups, British forces and civilians were all affected, leading to almost 4,000 deaths. The conflict largely ended in 1998 with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, which established a power-sharing government and has brought relative peace to the region since then. But a small minority on both sides remain active. As an assessment commissioned by the Secretary of State of Northern Ireland on the structure, role and purpose of paramilitary groups in 2015 states. 17 years after the 1998 Belfast Agreement, paramilitary groups remain a feature of life in Northern Ireland. The UDA, UVF and INLA have continued to recruit and all of the paramilitary groups maintain a relatively public profile in spite of being illegal organisations. With Jill Lawless for APN News writing in 2023, tensions remain between the two main communities, with fortified peace walls separating some nationalists and unionist neighbourhoods. And Vincent Kearney, Northern Editor, December 23, stating a body established by the Irish and British governments to monitor the activities of paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland has said they continue to exert control in many communities. Almost 30 years since they declared ceasefires, the main loyalist groups, the UVF and UDA, continue to recruit new members and are heavily involved in a wide range of criminal activity. Many of the paramilitaries are now involved in criminality and drug dealing, with tensions between and within groups resulting in serious disorder at times, as well as shootings and other attacks. One podcast I listened to when looking into Noah's case is called Riddle Me That, True Crime, and it featured Trish Devlin. Patricia Devlin is a crime journalist for the Northern Ireland edition of The Sunday World, Patricia covers crime in Northern Ireland, including Noah Donoghue's case. She has sat down with Noah's family. Towards the end of this podcast, Trish talked about how she is the target of horrible abuse because of the crime she covers. This includes misogynistic abuse, threats of violence and numerous death threats. 
and even threats against her children. One person threatened a horrific act against her baby son. Trish pressed charges against him for this. It turns out he is an extremely dangerous man with loyalist paramilitary ties. Trish then had to lodge a complaint with the police ombudsman against the police as they wouldn't investigate him. Her complaint was upheld, meaning it was true. Reading up on this afterwards, this man would not be held accountable anyway. The public prosecution's office said they didn't have sufficient evidence to prosecute. So this just goes to show all the different levels involved here, whether it be fear-based from the PSNI's side as some paramilitary groups target the police or their families, or whether it might be protecting an informant an undercover police officer or leaving paramilitary groups to deal with it themselves. There are so many layers as to why it might be difficult or even impossible to get answers or even a proper investigation with crime in Northern Ireland. So although things have gotten so much better in Northern Ireland, there are still echoes of the troubles. There are still active paramilitary groups. There is still sectarianism, meaning Protestant areas and Catholic areas. From Socialist Party Northern Ireland 2012, titled Sectarianism and the Girdwood Controversy, North Belfast has historically been one of the most divided areas in Northern Ireland. Almost half of Belfast's 99 peace walls are in the north of the city with a third of those being constructed since 1994 ceasefires. The changing demographics of the area have led to a tense struggle for territory around sectarian interfaces. In some areas, the evidence of this turf war is visible. For example, tricolours now flying on streets with faded red, white and blue curbstones. It must be stressed that it's only a very small minority on the ground on both sides that remain active today. For context, a few weeks prior to Noah Donoghue's death, a 15-year-old boy, Flynn Maguire, was cycling home. This was at approximately 8.45pm when a group of boys also on bikes began chasing him, asking him where he lived and what school he went to. Those were the repeated questions. Where do you live and what school do you go to? Flynn kept cycling as being on his own, he knew better than to stop. As he was fleeing, he was cycling past a man who was out walking his dog. This man was estimated by Flynn to be in his mid-thirties. He was wearing a grey tracksuit. He pushed Flynn from his bike, allowing the group of kids following Flynn to catch up with him. This group of around 15 kids then jumped Flynn and began to beat him. The man with the dog just walked away. Luckily, Flynn got away. He banged on the window of a passing car with blood streaming down his face. The car didn't stop, it kept going. He tried to summon help from multiple passing cars, but no one stopped to help him. Luckily, Flynn was familiar with the area he was in and he got to a nearby friend's house. This attack would leave Flynn requiring stitches in his head. They also stole Flynn's bag and his phone. Flynn's mum told the Sunday World, By the time I got there, he was wrapped in blankets because he was shaking so much. He had a cut to his head, bumps to the back of his head, a bruise underneath his eye. And again, the Sunday world, six months on, no one has been arrested or questioned over the mindless assault despite information on at least one of the individuals involved being passed to police. In the Irish news, Flynn's mother ended up lodging a complaint with the police ombudsman regarding the failings of the PSNI. Miss Hughes subsequently found her complaint had not been followed up. When questioned about this, a spokesman for the office of the police ombudsman said an administrative error led to Miss Hughes' complaint not being progressed as it should have been. A year later, Miss Hughes had to launch legal action against the PSNI. This was in 2021. I didn't find any update on Flynn Maguire's case. But the spot Flynn was attacked in had CCTV, which would have identified the man with the dog and possibly the people who had attacked him. I want to make something really clear here. The reason I have explained how Noah ended up in a sectarian part of town, in a loyalist stronghold, and I've spoken about 
the sectarian attack on Flynn is to demonstrate how utterly unlikely it is that Noah went into this area by choice of his own volition. He had allegedly been assaulted minutes before. If he was trying to escape his attackers, he could have just as easily continued on to the main street instead of turning into Northwood. So it begs the question, what was stopping Noah from getting back to safe ground? The CCTV footage, which was forthcoming, is not enough to show us whether or not someone was following Noah. There are only tiny snippets of Noah's journey and we have no CCTV footage from before or after Noah passed those cameras. We know nothing of what was captured on those CCTV cameras. So the CCTV footage we have do not prove there was no one following Noah. Remember, there were an estimated 180 cameras along Noah's actual route, the journey he took that day. Only 22 of these cameras were looked at. Unfortunately, it is the crucial parts of Noah's journey we don't have access to. The parts where Noah's clothes were actually taken off. There is no proof Noah took those clothes off himself or someone didn't make him do it. There's no proof that there was no one following Noah. We know, as discussed in the last episode, there was a silver car behind Noah as he turned into Northwood. We don't know who was in this car. The CCTV footage showed there was a pedestrian on the other side of the street. We don't know who this person was. The PSNI never called on these people to come forward. And then let's not forget Noah had snuck out the early hours of the morning of the day he went missing. His family were not aware of this and were not informed for two and a half years following Noah's death. So no public appeals were made for any witnesses of this secret outing to come forward. Regarding this secret outing, while Noah was missing, had he gotten mixed up in something? The men in Noah's life were teachers. Noah would have looked up to men, seen them as people to be respected, people to listen to. Noah's mum said Noah would easily have been coerced into doing something if ordered to do so by a male. On Noah's secret outing in the early hours, had he agreed to carry drugs for someone? Or during the assault, had he been forced to carry something? Or had something he was carrying been robbed from him? Were others informed of this, informed that Noah was travelling northwards? He was recognised by the addiction community. They knew him. Was he intercepted again later in his journey? So many questions. And this is what happens. This is the result of a lack of transparency. The National Crime Agency tells us county lines is where illegal drugs are transported from one area to another, often across police and local authority boundaries, although not exclusively usually by children or vulnerable people who are coerced into it by gangs. The county line is the mobile phone line used to take orders of drugs. Importing areas, areas where the drugs are taken to, are reporting increased levels of violence and weapon-related crimes as a result of this trend. According to the National Crime Agency, Individuals exploited in this manner, particularly children, are frequently subjected to physical, mental and or sexual abuse. In some cases, they may even be trafficked far from their homes to support the network's drug operations. Young people involved do not recognise themselves as victims or realise that they have been groomed into criminal activity. Noah sneaking out the early hours of the day he went missing was so out of character for him. Two and a half years following Noah's death, as discussed in part one, and following a leak on Twitter, Noah's family first became aware of this secret outing. Noah was outside for 35 minutes. In the rain, he came back soaking wet and definitely without his headphones. They've never been located. Who did Noah speak with? We don't know because the PS and I have only released to Noah's family the footage of Noah leaving his home and returning, not where he went or who he made contact with. 
but this has caused fears that Noah may have been coerced into carrying drugs or money later that day on his bizarre final journey. There are so many fragmented pieces to Noah's case, it's understandably very difficult to follow to get any understanding of what possibly really happened. There are often snippets put out on social media or in the press about another witness possibly having come forward or the investigative team coming into possession of more info. So I'm going to bring it all together into one timeline as we did in part one. Again, I won't be naming anyone for legal reasons and because I don't have a source to back up the names. Although I do know the names that were given to some extent. For context, we've got to begin with the street where Noah and his mum Fiona lived and the Queen's Quarter Hostel. Fiona was one of many who had been on to the PSNI to get something done about the residents of this hostel. Because of the drug use, the drug dealing and the type of people it was attracting, as discussed in the last episode. Noah's mum also complained regularly directly to the hostel, the management, about the people staying there. Now, this was not taken kindly by some of the residents. One man in particular used to harass Fiona and Noah when he would see them, hurling abuse at them. On that fateful day when Noah left his mum at their apartment and he was seen on CCTV cycling down the street. As he passed by, people were seen on CCTV watching him cycle past them and on down the street. Maria was the person who had come forward saying Noah had been assaulted by four men she had been with that day, that they may have threatened Noah with a needle and possibly even jabbed him. And they had robbed him. One of these four men who were said to have assaulted Noah was none other than the resident of the hostel who had regularly hurled abuse at Fiona and Noah for complaining about him and his friends. He knew who Noah was. He recognised him regularly. At the time of this alleged assault, which would have been minutes after Noah was caught cycling on CCTV, passing these people on the street, the PSNI say they have Daryl Paul on CCTV in another part of town. Now, no one else has seen this. So Daryl Paul was only convicted of having Noah's belongings, nothing else. I'll talk more about this a little later in this episode. Noah is then caught on CCTV and indeed he no longer has his backpack. His phone would be found on Limestone Street in a children's playground. A playground that due to lockdown had been closed. It is said the phone must have been thrown in over the wall, which was around 20 foot high, although it didn't have a scratch on it. Now, Noah's phone was brand new, in pristine condition, so any marks would have stood out on it. Although snippets of CCTV were gathered or handed over, the vital pieces of Noah's journey has never come forward. No footage and no witnesses to Noah then somehow being stripped of all his clothing, left cycling naked, uphill into a loyalist stronghold, exhausted, frightened and checking back over his shoulder. We don't have any footage to show if anyone was following Noah. This was somewhere he would never voluntarily have gone, had never have been before. This area was not safe for Noah and Noah and his mum were recognised to the addicts and homeless in this community because of the street that they lived on where the hostel, a few doors down, had resulted in people gathering outside Fiona and Noah's door. The final footage of Noah, the last time Noah was allegedly seen, was originally stated to be at 6.11pm, changed four times, and this was broken during the process, so cannot be checked. As Noah cycled, then walked naked in this cul-de-sac, he was seen by people, obviously. This was a sunny summer afternoon, Sunday evening, 611 People were outside in their gardens and finally allowed to gather retaining social distancing outside. Three people from this area gave statements saying they saw Noah naked. They believed it was a Father's Day prank. So they didn't do anything. They didn't contact anybody. They didn't help him. His bike was removed from the street and placed in someone's yard. Some of his clothing were placed on a wall. The rest of his clothes have never been found. One of these witnesses said that when she saw Noah, he was heading towards two men at the top of the cul-de-sac, standing outside a car which had the doors wide open. 
Was this the essential piece of evidence, the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle? We'll get to it. When the search party learned of Noah's last known location, they headed there to search for Noah. So many people came together for the search for this child who had disappeared in such strange circumstances. People from both sides of the community. It was said to be amazing how everyone came together to search for Noah. However, when the search party went to help search for Noah in that area he was last seen, that cul-de-sac, they were shouted at. I won't repeat what I heard was said, but I have seen the footage of this. So I am going to say that one person in particular shouted abuse at them, was extremely angry towards them for, for even being there. And yes, Noah was a biracial Catholic boy in a loyalist stronghold, but he was now missing and he had been seen extremely vulnerable before he disappeared, scared, naked, exhausted. So this reaction shocked a lot of people igniting the rumour that this was a sectarian issue. However, considering the other things we're going to talk about, it is believed that this could be a fear response. And that's why some residents have to this day declined to give a statement as to what they saw. Why some footage has never been handed over, including that from a camera potentially recording the entrance to that storm drain where Noah was eventually found. People are afraid to say it is believed. They fear for their safety, for their family's safety. Now I saw someone connected to these people say in their defence that the search party, it disrupted everything and that it scared their own children and that that's why they didn't want people searching there. Because When the media or television cameras were around, everyone was very pleasant and eager to help. Unfortunately, this is possibly just the beginning of the end of Noah's journey. It is alleged that two young men with paramilitary ties, finding Noah in this very vulnerable condition, abducted him and took him to Mount Vernon Flats three minutes away where he was possibly kept for up to four days and then drowned in a bathtub. His body then placed in the storm drain for the PSNI to retrieve. And here's how we have that information. This information came forward to Noah's team who we'll talk about later. In 2021 a prisoner confessed to another prisoner that he was involved in Noah's murder. Reportedly very emotionally, he broke down and confessed to another inmate how he and another man were in that area, the North Belfast area, where Noah was in on the Sunday, allegedly to carry out a vigilante attack and they happened to see Noah when he was naked. They stopped the car and attacked Noah. They then bundled Noah into the car and drove him to a flat in a predominantly loyalist area of Belfast where they further assaulted Noah, then drowned him in the bathtub. They then got help from paramilitaries. The UDA were called to dispose of Noah's body. This confession was relayed to the Donahues when the inmate who was confessed to got out of prison. They then handed over a detailed written account to the PSNI and to the coroner. Around a month later, the prisoner who had allegedly confessed was released from prison. Crime journalist Tricia Devlin located him in a relative's house in County Armagh and questioned him about the alleged confession. But he denied ever saying anything, saying that he had never been in that area that day, had nothing to do with the child's death and in the original article about this confession this crime journalist had written this newspaper understands that the man in question has some links to loyalist paramilitaries in the north Belfast area but says however when questioned by the journalist this ex-prisoner said they had no links to paramilitaries claiming he himself is under threat from a loyalist third group over a vigilante incident in North Down. 
The PSNI stated that they were following up this line of investigation following the printing of the confession in the Sunday World. They subsequently said there was no proof. As no water sample was taken and tested against the water in Noah's lungs, this cannot be verified as the prisoner now denies confessing. On a page set up for Noah on Facebook by supporters called Noah Donahue Justice, A man named Michael Murray wrote a message saying that they had this child in a gaff in Tigers Bay Road. They had him alive for four days, then drown him in a bath. He said, sorry for writing this on the drink. I'm probably going to jail very soon if something isn't done. I can't effing sleep at night thinking about it. So imagine poor Fiona WTF. He also posted that he had hung around the Queen's Quarters hostel. I believe this man is now deceased. Then in 2023, October, there was graffiti on a wall in Lenadoon, West Belfast. The graffiti said Noah, Mount Vernon, 10th floor, murdered bathtub. There was a blue teddy bear and two notes left at the base of the wall. The notes contained names and addresses. One of the notes was written on a postcard. The image on the front of the postcard was a photo of the Crown Bar in Belfast. One of the names mentioned on the notes was Jamie Shaw. Jamie Shaw had sent a Snapchat video, a disturbing Snapchat video, saying Noah's name and that they were burying a body, that nobody would be finding him for a while. Charges were pressed against Mr. Shaw for posting this inappropriate video, as this video was passed around on social media and was creating quite a stir. But this was kept from Noah's mum, Fiona. Jamie Shaw's legal team reached out to Fiona and asked her to stop the charges being pressed against Jamie for posting a video. And Fiona agreed, without knowing at the time that Jamie had been talking about her son, about burying her son. But then there are some more details which also came forward. The night Noah went missing, Sunday 21st of June 2020, one resident in the area heard someone trying to get in the back door of her house. The handle was going on the door. One person said they heard crying around midnight. And also multiple residents heard screaming. They said it sounded like a woman or a child. And also someone was seen out the back of the houses with a flashlight as if they were searching for something. Now, all these things were very unusual. It was not common to see or hear these things. And this was around three o'clock in the morning. Had these occurrences anything to do with Noah? Was it Noah trying to get inside? Was it Noah screaming, crying? Or was someone searching for him? Remember, at this time, the PSNI believed Noah's last location was Cave Hill. So this was the first night he went missing. They hadn't yet learned about the bizarre turn Noah's journey took that day. So who was searching out the back of the houses? Who was screaming? Who was trying to get into a house? And has this been fully investigated? We don't know. Hopefully, the inquest will shed light on all of these details. The high-rise flats mentioned in the graffiti are in the area where the murderers of 15-year-old Thomas Devlin appeared from, Mount Vernon Estate. In 2005, Thomas, along with two of his friends, went to the shop to get sweets. On their way home, two men left the nearby Mount Vernon Estate, where they lived at the time of the stabbing, and launched an unprovoked attack. The two men... Gary Taylor, 23, of Ross House, Mount Vernon, and Nigel Brown, 25, of Mount Collier Avenue, Belfast. Taylor and Brown had just come from Mount Vernon. Thomas did not survive this attack. One of his friends was stabbed but survived and the other friend got away. So there were witnesses. The two men were charged and found guilty of murder and attempted murder of Thomas's friend, Jonathan McKee, who was stabbed too, receiving a minimum of 30 years and 20 years, respectively. Thankfully, they do remain there. In 2012, they made the headlines again as they were trying to get their convictions overturned. B. 
BBC reported that loyalist paramilitaries allegedly told one of the men jailed for murdering schoolboy Thomas Devlin not to cooperate with the police investigation. The Court of Appeal heard the evidence of a UVF intervention could have impacted on how the jury dealt with Nigel Brown's failure to testify. The judge referred to an allegation that Brown was told not to give evidence about events surrounding the killing because it would reflect badly on the UVF. Mr Harvey contended that the information was fairly nuanced. The UVF in this particular area of Mount Vernon, it is a small enclave where it is common knowledge that it controls or seeks to create the impression that it controls this area and what happens within it, the barrister told the court. Last year, one of them made headlines again, protesting lack of privacy as his Skype calls were being monitored to his fiancée and his family, and he won. They are no longer allowed to be monitored for any prisoners. But back to Noah's case, although that doesn't end the coincidences. There was also a voice note shared, which was going around on social media, further to the graffiti listing names and places. Noah's mum, Fiona, became a target for harassment. The man's name is William Logue Miller from Northwood Parade, North Belfast. In September 2021, police were alerted and arrested Logue in December 2021 after linking the comments to his Twitter account. He was convicted, put on probation for two years, and he had to pay Fiona £500. This article goes on to say, William Logue is a nephew of notorious UVF killer Mark Haddock. Here's an extract written by Hugh Jordan, September 23rd for the Sunday World. Billy Logue of Northwood Parade of North Belfast was convicted in court last month of harassing Fiona Donoghue. And we can today reveal Logue was once jailed for being a member of a group of men arrested on their way to smash up a Portadown pub in 1997, alleged to have been frequented by members of the Loyalist Volunteer Force. The attack was ordered by his uncle, UVF boss and RUC special branch tout Mark Haddock. Haddock is the notorious UVF Mount Vernon commander, whose decades-long reign of terror happened while he was working as a police informer. His unit was exposed by then-police ombudsman Nula Alone's report in 2010, which uncovered wholesale collusion with the RUC. Mount Vernon was riddled with police agents, yet despite being on the police payroll, they were allowed to carry on killing. So why would a man with strong ties to the UVF target a grieving mother who is just looking for answers about the death of her son. As I said, I am only naming people that have already been convicted of the crimes they were accused of. Although I won't be naming the people who allegedly assaulted Noah, the two young men who allegedly abducted and murdered Noah, what I can tell you is that all of these people are connected in at least one way. One of the aforementioned has ties to every single person in, allegedly involved from the beginning of Noah's journey right up until the people who allegedly dumped his body in the storm drain. Both of the two young men who allegedly assaulted and killed Noah had ties to paramilitaries. Not members, but both are connected through bloodlines, familial ties. One of the two young men took his own life the day before Noah's body was found in the storm drain, having allegedly first confessed to his uncle about his role in Noah's death. His girlfriend at the time denied he had anything to do with Noah's death and was posting an abundance of photographs and posts on social media about him. However, later on took everything down and when asked about it said that he had gotten involved in something he shouldn't have. The other young man left the area. Some say he was ordered to do so by a certain illegal group he had familial ties to. But he did not leave the headlines or his life of violent crime. He has continued with violent acts, the latest being against a young teenage girl who he knocked unconscious. However, the paramilitary group he has ties to, the UVF, say they are no longer associated with him since he was banished from North Belfast for antisocial behaviour. The Sunday World 
tells us loyalist sources have told the Sunday world they believe Beep has not only fallen out of favour with loyalists in North Belfast, but now also in Derry. He had some protection from the UVF because of who his relative is, but that relative isn't involved in UVF anymore, said one source. This man had recently been released from prison for a violent sectarian crime just before Noah went missing. Just one note about this scenario. You'll remember one of the witnesses who came forward having seen Noah on that final part of his journey. She said he was running towards two men. These two men were said to be standing outside a car with the doors wide open. Were these the same two young men who allegedly bundled Noah into their car and took him to Mount Vernon Flats, eventually ending his life? Did they chase after Noah? OK, quick recap. Noah went missing from North Wood Crescent on Sunday. The searches in that area didn't begin until the following day as no one was notified until then. That day, Monday, one of the four men who were said to have attacked Noah and who had been living in the hostel moved out of the hostel. That evening, it was raining, so the PSNI called off the search. Noah was naked. On Tuesday, Daryl Paul and Maria Nolan tried to sell Noah's laptop. Fiona, Noah's mum, was not allowed onto the street where Noah was last seen. The bin lorries were allowed onto Northwood Crescent to empty the bins while members of the PSNI stood in the street. Noah's belongings were still missing. Police put out a public appeal for Noah's backpack, books, laptop and the items of clothing that were still missing, including Noah's North Face jacket. Later that evening, Daryl Paul tried selling Noah's laptop at a party. On Wednesday, the PSNI were informed by way of an anonymous phone call that Daryl Paul had Noah's belongings. Although Daryl Paul was a career criminal, an active addict, this information was kept from Noah's family and from the public. The search for a missing person continued. No evidence of third party involvement, they said. Around this time, the PSNI also became aware Noah had snuck out of his house in the early hours of Sunday morning. Again, this wasn't shared with Noah's family or the public. They have never revealed where Noah went, or more importantly, who he may have made contact with. Thousands of people from all over Belfast came out to search. The storm drain was searched by professionals. No trace of Noah was found. Thursday, Noah's backpack, books, but not his jacket, were seized from Daryl Paul's residence while he was being arrested for unrelated charges. He was not formally questioned about Noah, even though Noah's name was written on the books in the backpack. No forensics were taken at his residence. Noah is still missing. It is now known, due to information disclosure to Noah's family, PSNI got intelligence around this time that Noah would be found in the storm drain. Noah's laptop was seized from Marie Nolan's room in the hostel. No arrests were made. No formal questioning took place. They took the laptop and left. The public were informed that Noah's belongings had been located with help from a member of the public. Nothing about the career criminal and his girlfriend having them. It was actually crime journalist Trish Devlin who discovered who in fact had Noah's belongings months later. Superintendent Moore Clark made a public statement saying Noah has in some way suffered an injury and is disorientated and requires assistance. Rumours of a head injury and possible concussion ran through the media. A senior officer was photographed through a long lens from a nearby motorway by a journalist at a manhole access point to the storm drain. The search of the storm drain was officially terminated. The public were told to stand down from searching to give the PSNI 48 hours. On Friday, no further information was forthcoming. However, a young man very close by, would take his own life. On Saturday, it would be announced that a body had been found in the storm drain, as yet formally unidentified. 
No foul play was announced before Noah was even identified, before a pathologist had set eyes on Noah's body. Noah's body had no signs of being in a storm drain for six days. His hands and feet were the only parts of his body which displayed signs of water damage. No signs of the highly contaminated water he was lying in. No signs of rodent damage. No signs of insect damage. Time of death is often calculated by studying the extent of insect damage. There was none. No signs of a head injury which could have happened when Noah was wearing his helmet cycling his bike. He did, however, have a large gash on his head where his helmet would have been protecting him. And I apologise, in the previous episode I said the circumference of this injury was 14 centimetres. It wasn't. It was 16 centimetres. So that was my mistake. So how did the PSNI know that Noah had a head injury? The CCTV showed Noah's fall from his bike, but he didn't bang his head. Noah was lying 950 metres from the storm drain entrance, 40 metres from where the senior officer had been seen on the Thursday looking into the manhole. Are we to believe Noah crawled and climbed 950 metres through a quote from Moore Clark, extremely challenging environment, unquote. Through chambers, chains, large chunks of debris, without busting up his elbows, his knees, his shins, his whole body, without any protection, even of clothing. And then waiting for the tide to come in to drown himself. Or even then, accidentally drowning when the tide came in. There has never been a reconstruction done to show us how this could be possible. Although the family have asked for one repeatedly. And remember... Noah was afraid of the dark. Even if he did miraculously happen upon this storm drain, which was miraculously unlocked, he would not have entered it willingly. The public were told not to speculate. Noah apparently ended up here in this cul-de-sac. Disturbingly, in the last CCTV footage of him taken on this road, he has no clothes on. From the bridge, you wouldn't even know what was down here. And then the police believe not, he headed towards to a storm drain behind these homes. Noah was afraid of the dark. Noah, it's not the most inviting of places. Like, why would you go in there? Although requested on the day Noah was found by the pathologist and later by the family's legal counsel, no water sample was taken and compared from the storm drain to the water that was found in Noah's lungs. That was such a crucial step in this investigation, vital to have compared those two samples of water, the storm drain water to the water found in Noah's lungs. Why was this not done? The PSNI had said they would do this. They had agreed it needed to be done. What stopped them or who stopped them? We'll know after the inquest. On Sunday... A white van was sealed off and was to be forensically examined as part of the ongoing investigation into Noah's disappearance and death. No further information has ever been forthcoming regarding this white van or its relevance to the investigation. Three weeks later, the police told Noah's family they had delivered leaflets around the area Noah was last seen, requesting people to come forward with information. They hadn't. This was put down to miscommunication. The coroner, Joe McCriskin, recently recused from Noah's case, commissioned an Oxford University expert for a psychological assessment to have a look at all the information that they had on Noah, along with his electronic records. This psychiatrist was someone this coroner had used before and was a specialist in suicide, adult suicide actually custodial adult suicides. However, the coroner did not supply this expert with the details of Noah's secret outing the morning of his disappearance, or even the fact that Noah had snuck out, returning without his headphones and drowned it wet, or with the knowledge that someone had Noah's phone straight after Noah had on that fateful day. You'll remember I told you that there was a photo taken on Noah's phone after Noah was last seen without any of his belongings, including his clothing. 
Now, the Donoghue team will have their own psychiatrist, one who specialises in adolescence, who will give their professional opinion on Noah's possible state of mind for the inquest. This is how it works. The coroner will have his chosen professionals. Noah's family will have their chosen professionals. But the coroner's psychiatrist was to produce a report. It was feared that because of what he specialised in, suicides, albeit adult custodial suicides, that this psychiatrist would veer towards Noah's death being a suicide. The psychiatrist's report was based on reports, materials he had in front of him. The report. The report is not public, but the Donoghue's team, at least some of them, have seen the report. So in his report on Noah's state of mind, on his mental state, he suggests Noah was struggling with his sexual identity. Now, no one in Noah's life, actual life, agrees with this. His family, his friends. This report also suggests Noah was being bullied for being gay. This led to a lot of internet sleuths posting about Noah getting bullied, leading him to take his own life. However, besides all of the other evidence which refutes this, these findings apparently were from snippets of information simply out of context. Some kid had scribbled gay on one of Noah's school books, as you do, as all kids do. That's all it was. Because he had scribbled it a few times over a few different pages, the psychologist assumed that this was multiple people writing gay on multiple different days surmising that Noah was being bullied by a few people for being gay. The fact Noah's team say is there was no bullying. Noah was never bullied but it wasn't the psychiatrist's role to conduct an investigation. He could only work with what he had in front of him. Context is everything having the full picture. And that's why no one can get a mental health diagnosis over the phone. It takes speaking with someone, getting the full picture, getting to know who they are, what their character is like, and speaking to them multiple times to form a full picture of someone's psychiatric state. Unfortunately, that's not possible in Noah's case. Noah is no longer with us. But at least family, friends, loved ones can explain these things, help to give a full picture to the psychiatrist for the coroner's inquest. One of the books Noah was carrying in his backpack that day was by Jordan Peterson, titled 12 Rules of Life. Now, this is a very popular book among young people by a very well-known author, a Canadian author with over 8 billion fans online, one of them being Noah. Now, Noah was a big fan. He listened to Peters' podcasts and had recently received this book from his mother. And this book became a huge thing in Noah's case. It was looked at through a magnifying glass and all sorts of conspiracies began flying around because Jordan Peterson is a psychologist, a controversial right-wing Canadian psychologist. And with Noah being a big fan, he followed Peterson on social media along with over 8 million other fans, and would search terms, Peterson would say, including ancient biblical terms. One of the last messages Noah sent was to one of Peterson's Instagram pages. Now, this message, it wasn't replied to, but also no one seems to be able to retrieve it, including the PSNI, so we don't know what it said. The psychiatrist hired by the coroner believed that Noah, who he perceived as struggling with sexual identity, must have felt that his issues went against his respected author and famous psychologist Jordan Peterson. As I spoke about in part one, Noah had this lovely group of really close friends. Noah's mum Fiona calls them band of brothers because they were just so close and supportive. If Noah were gay or if he were having any issues with anything, that would have been absolutely not a problem to Noah's family, his friends, anyone in his life. It was up for discussion. Everything was up for discussion, always. Noah was raised around same-sex couples. But this report allegedly speculates that struggling with his sexual identity clashed with Jordan Peterson's teachings and beliefs, therefore leading Noah to to seek out unknown water, the storm drain, 
something Peterson had referred to to take his own life. So his conclusion was that this was not an accidental death. This was possibly suicide. And again, this takes us back to Noah not even knowing about the storm drain. How would he have in an area he was not welcome? Not knowing it would be unlocked and never having looked it up online. Having to go to a loyalist area where he certainly wouldn't be welcome. A kid who looked up everything, but not that. And nothing to do with ending his life. No plans, no methods researched, nothing. A kid who planned everything, planned nothing that day, only to go to Cave Hill. To call his mum at 6.30 and to be home in time for tea at 8pm. In fact, one other thing he did look up earlier that day was Trinity College Dublin. You'll remember I told you Noah wanted to be a doctor. Well, his dream was to go to Trinity College Dublin to study medicine. And that he looked up the day he went missing. Does that sound like the actions of someone who doesn't plan on being here tomorrow? And then there's also the bizarreness of how could Noah's body not have water damage, not have bruises, cuts from crawling down naked 950 metres of a storm drain, dark, pitch dark storm drain, and end up lying in contaminated water for six days. Make it make sense. Something else I would like to know, because no one seems to be able to tell this. How deep was the water in the storm drain? I know it was during a dry spell, but I also know that where Noah's body was found, I heard Donald McIntyre, who I'll introduce in a moment, describe as a little basket of water is where Noah was found. And I know this storm drain was fresh water to salt water, so the tide would come in twice a day. But no one seems to be able to know how far up the storm drain this tide would come. I heard Noah's mum say that where Noah was lying, where he was found... Due to the tide, Noah would have been submerged in water twice a day. It's difficult for me to imagine how he drowned there. And how bizarre to believe that this would be how anyone would choose to end their lives. It sounds like he would have had to lie there waiting for the tide to come in and drown him. I guess, hopefully, the inquest will shed light on all these issues. Did Noah have a mental break? It is possible, especially considering he allegedly suffered an assault, which could have petrified him. But he could also just have had a mental break. It could explain why Noah went into an area he shouldn't have or wouldn't have in normal circumstances. It could explain why he removed his clothing in that area, even maybe why he snuck out the night before, although he did seem perfectly normal when his mum was speaking to him on Sunday. But he had snuck out in the pouring rain early hours of the morning, come back without his headphones and then this bizarre journey on Sunday. However, interestingly, I heard Donal McIntyre, investigator for the Donoghue family, speak about how he had spoken to a mental health expert. This person had explained to him how people suffering from a mental health crisis, they will travel either on a level or downhill. But they will not go uphill. I don't know if it's because the body goes into autopilot and it takes energy to go uphill. I don't know. But this is what the mental health expert told Donald. Noah had turned uphill into Northwood instead of continuing downhill, which would have taken him back to safety. And again, there's the storm drain. It's location, finding it, finding it unlocked and the autopsy results. It doesn't work. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. And the condition Noah's body was in. Fiona Donoghue, referencing where Noah was found in the storm drain, said that 950 metres, it is the length of nine football pitches. That the storm drain was pitch black. He was afraid of the dark. Noah's body is really the only piece of evidence that we actually do have. And the evidence doesn't lie. The final footage of Noah, originally stated to be at 6.11pm, changed four times in total and was broken during the process, so can no longer be checked. In fact, more than one piece of evidence was broken or lost. CCTV registered, they now don't exist. 
Too many things don't add up here. Individuals took it upon themselves from the PSNI to message Noah's family, telling them to continue what they are doing, that they are on the right track. Now, if that doesn't tell you something, I don't know what will. On the 18th of July 2022, the PSNI finally deemed Noah's case critical. Officers in the PSNI had requested Noah's case to be made critical, but it was denied twice. There would be an internal review carried out within the PSNI regarding Noah's case. Now, we all know an internal review, it's like staff reviewing staff. But even the internal review found that for a missing child, proper resources were not put in place for Noah. The PSNI cited financial constraints as the reason for no overtime being allocated to the search for Noah and missing person fatigue. Now, there's a term I haven't come across before. Missing person fatigue. So we have a community here, a divided community. This unspeakable tragedy happens. But a minority on one side are too afraid to speak. Fear of your own safety and that of your family, it must be a nightmare. But someone's carrying those thoughts with you of what happened, that thing you're not allowed to speak of. Are there children carrying that secret? Did children see Noah that summer's evening, naked and frightened in an area he knew he wouldn't get help? What must that do to someone? To be told never to speak of it because that scared, naked child He was found dead in the storm drain behind the houses. What must that do? And yes, there is still a conflict going on between two sides of this community. But a child has lost their life and that's different, isn't it? We saw that by how both sides of the community came out to search for Noah. How much love and support were given at the time to Noah's family. Everyone wanted answers to know what happened when Noah's body was found. But a small minority, a a very small minority, stayed silent. It draws similarities to a brutal murder in West Belfast in 2005, when father of two Robert McCarty, aged 35, was beaten and stabbed following a fight that broke out in a pub. He defended his friend and he got murdered for it. In Robert's case, the person or people accused were members of a nationalist paramilitary group, the IRA. Although this wasn't an official paramilitary hit, the people involved were members of this group and that was the same in the sense that they were protected. They were feared. They weren't touched. From the Ground Truth Project, originally published by the Boston Globe in April 2023, it says that following Robert's murder, no one in the bar called an ambulance and no one called the police. The local IRA crew did what they called cleaning the crime scene, wiping up the blood and fingerprints and disposing of the murder weapon. They told everyone in the bar that what had happened was IRA business. Although there were potentially 74 witnesses, some said nothing, no statements. Over 40 of them were allegedly in the one toilet at the time of the murder. Many of these people were lifelong friends of the victim. To date, no one has been found guilty. The murder weapon, the knife, along with the CCTV evidence of the murder have never been found. Robert's passionate family, his sisters, have continued fighting for justice and say that they won't stop. Robert's widow, Brigine, and his sister Paula received bomb threats and menacing letters, warning of retribution for them and their families. Their fight for justice continues. The PSNI have always maintained that an extensive, thorough and professional investigation was carried out into this horrendous crime. Many things about Noah's case don't sit comfortably with people. One of those things I would like to highlight And it's to do with the information we have regarding Daryl Paul, Maria Nolan and the four men who allegedly assaulted and robbed Noah that fateful day. Let me try to explain. So think about it. On Sunday, Maria and Paul were together. And then Maria came forward and gave a statement that she was with four men who attacked and robbed Noah. 
and we did see CCTV of Noah without his backpack. Maria's boyfriend, Daryl, just happens upon this backpack and Noah's jacket. Now, Noah lost these things at two different times because the first piece of CCTV we see, Noah does not have his backpack, but he has his jacket. Eight minutes later, we see Noah without his jacket. But Daryl Paul has both of these things and he says he found them at Ulster University, the art college. And although the PSNI have footage of Daryl Paul finding the backpack, they don't have footage of who left it there. And then the timings look fishy too. Daryl Paul is, re- is arrested for unrelated offences on the Thursday while Noah is still missing. Noah's belongings are seized from Daryl Paul, his laptop from Daryl's girlfriend's room in the hostel who supposedly witnessed the attack and robbery. And then on the Thursday, the public are asked to stand down from the search. That same day that Noah's belongings are seized and the PSNI get intelligence that Noah will be found in the storm drain. Now, this was seen in black and white by Noah's family. On Saturday, a warrant is issued to the PSNI permitting them to search houses where Noah was last seen. But it wasn't used because the announcement was made on Saturday then that a body had been found in the storm drain and there was no foul play and no third party involvement. It just doesn't sit right, all of this. I don't know what it is, but I'd like to ask you viewers to think about it and let me know what you think. Also, when the witness Maria came forward to make her official statement regarding Noah's assault, she was immediately warned by the PSNI not to waste their time. It was like they didn't want to hear. Daryl Paul was sentenced to three months imprisonment for having stolen property, that is, Noah's belongings. But not his jacket, that has never been found, even though it was seen in Daryl Paul's residence and someone else saw him leave it somewhere. This man continuously has been in front of the courts since also. Latterly in 2023, Daryl Paul made the headlines again when he, his brother William Paul and their buddy Robert Terence Halpin, an amputee due to a paramilitary shooting, were accused and convicted for a series of burglaries. Three Belfast men with more than 470 convictions between them were today jailed for a series of burglaries. Daryl Paul, 35, who was previously jailed for finding and stealing Noah Donahue's rucksack, was sentenced to 15 months in custody with a similar period on licence. Paul pleaded guilty to two counts of burglary and taking and driving away a motor vehicle. His 39-year-old brother, William Paul, of Tate's Avenue in South Belfast, admitted two counts of burglary and was jailed for 10 months, followed by 14 months on supervised licence following his release. Co-accused Robert Terence Halpin, 39, of Ethel Street in South Belfast, was jailed for seven months, followed by 11 months on licence, after he pleaded guilty to burglary and taking a car and admitting four counts of handling stolen goods. Defence barrister Stephen Toll said Halpin had to have his left leg amputated in 2014 after paramilitaries blasted him with a shotgun. As we've spoken about, the PSNI had access to Noah's electronic devices to investigate what happened to Noah. Noah's mum, Fiona, granted them access to everything. She wanted a thorough and full investigation to find out what happened to her son, but things were not made easy for her. For one... No answers were forthcoming. There seemed to be no lines of communication open with the PSNI. Then, when they were looking for access to Noah's electronic devices, she said yes, go ahead, through her solicitors. Eight months after Noah's death, Fiona told the Sunday World, In August, we were told in black and white from the police that they had forensically checked Noah's laptop, phone and Kindle and his emails. They exhausted everything and couldn't find anything. Here's an extract from the Sunday World. PSNI detectives warned the mother of Noah Donahue they would serve her with a warrant over access to email accounts on the tragic schoolboy's electronic devices, she has revealed. Heartbroken, Fiona Donahue told the Sunday World how the demand was made just a number of weeks ago after previously telling the family they had fully forensically investigated all her son's devices, including his laptop, last year. 
However, three weeks ago, the mum was again contacted by investigators who said they had not looked at a number of email accounts on Noah's computer. After asking for access, which was verbally granted through her solicitors, Fiona said she was then warned that police could issue a warrant against her. Fiona added, they used the word warrant with me, yet they can't get a warrant for the suspects and career criminals named by a witness as being involved in an assault. It's loaded wording. They also used the word warrant with the Department for Infrastructure to seize information from them, the two groups of people who want to help. And then recently Fiona's team found that photo of someone's hand that had been taken at least 40 minutes after Noah could possibly have had his phone. In fact, Noah was certainly naked at this time up in Northwood. The PSNI seemed to find that irrelevant. They exhausted everything and couldn't find anything, they said. There was a corporate manslaughter case launched against the Department of Infrastructure for the access point to the storm drain being unlocked. But the latest I could find on that is they say that the gate, by law, didn't have to have a lock on it. I believe because of Noah's case, that has now changed or is in the process of being changed. I believe there was also a lock put on that gate following Noah's death. So Noah's family have their own team conducting an independent investigation. This team is led by Donald McIntyre, a well-known investigative journalist specialising in investigations, undercover operations and television exposés, together with international experts. A fundraiser was started by Donald for the investigation and to create a documentary on Noah's case, with surplus funds to be donated to children's charities in Northern Ireland, including the Noah Donoghue Foundation. This documentary will be released following the inquest. As you can imagine, there's lots of information that just legally cannot be released before the inquest. There are lots of details in Noah's case which his family can't speak about and which the PS and I have not released. But that should all be uncovered with the inquest. So this team have been conducting their own investigation and they have uncovered a lot of details regarding Noah's disappearance and death, some of which I have shared with you here today. But again... They can't share everything yet, until the inquest has been heard. I suspect we will all know a lot more following the inquest, and hopefully a lot of questions will finally be answered, and there will be justice for Noah, Fiona, and the rest of Noah's family and Noah's army. There is definitely huge public interest in Noah's case, and rightly so. The public deserve to have answers. Under the Freedom of Information Act, this team put questions to the PSNI regarding Noah's investigation. Questions which, if answered, would tell everyone a lot more about what happened that day and during those six days when Noah remained missing. But these questions were not answered. The PSNI said it would cost too much to answer them because investigation for each question would be needed to see what information they had on it, etc., So none of these were answered. I found it interesting that, and they have the right to do this, but the PSNI posted this up on their website, all of the questions and the fact that they hadn't answered the questions. Noah's case remains to be classed as death by misadventure or suicide. But why has there been so much contempt towards Noah's grieving family, secondary victims of this tragedy? From all angles, professional and personal contempt. It really is shocking. But there's hope. Noah has an extremely passionate, strong and extremely determined family and team and an army of very concerned citizens. Hundreds of thousands of people looking for the truth about what happened to Noah and Noah's inquest is looming. At an inquest, all information relating to the PSNI's investigation will be released. That is, all information not protected by the PII we spoke about in the last episode. From the pence of quail.com, Donald McIntyre says he has no doubt that the PS and I will try to ambush the inquest with more evidence that will upset the family. The result of all this is that Noah did not get the investigation he deserves. Journalists will bring expert eyes on this and be able to investigate the investigation. 
at the moment, the date for the inquest is set to be February 2025, although that could change. But it is going to be held with a jury, a jury who will have all the available evidence before them, except the 600 pages hidden by the PII. It is also going to be with a new coroner. The Sunday World reports that the PS and I say at all times we seek to work sensitively with Noah's loved ones and with their consent as we make inquiries. Noah would have turned 19 this year. Lyra McKee was a 29 year old freelance journalist who was shot dead while observing a riot in Derry, Northern Ireland on the weekend of the Easter Rising parades in 2019. The last paragraph of the piece of work Lyra was working on before her death was titled We were meant to be the generation that reaped the joys of peace. And here's what Lyra wrote. The third promise the politicians made and broke was the one that hurt the most. It was felt mostly in the areas that had already been ravaged. The ones where the gunmen continued to roam. Your children they told our parents, will be safe now. With the peace deal, the days of young people disappearing and dying would be gone. Yet this turned out to be a lie too. The new IRA claimed responsibility for Lyra's murder. Noah's team had phone lines set up to allow for people to come forward with information. And people did saying they had information regarding Noah's disappearance and death, but they had to put their families first, so they could not give the information. And they wouldn't call back. Noah's mum Fiona went on a podcast called Anything Goes with James English. It's definitely one to watch. I'll link it below. In this podcast, Fiona said that she understands the fear, but please come forward. Here's a statement taken from that podcast. If you have any belief in God, you know you have to come forward. How can you live? Noah was a beautiful child. I would just pray that someone's brave enough to come forward and give information. I'm praying, like I do have faith, that somebody will do the right thing. And I do understand the fear, but nothing will change if people can't speak up. These paramilitaries are bullies. They bully their own communities and I just can't take it. Noah's life stands for something. And Noah wouldn't take bullies either. People are afraid. Don't be afraid because that's what bullies want. The media are not taking this on because it would cause social unrest. I believe somebody harmed my baby. Noah's mum Fiona and Aunt Neve have not given up. They have campaigned tirelessly for answers, for the truth to come out. They are very active on social media. I'll link their sites below. In August 2020, landmarks across the country, including Belfast City Hall, the Titanic Belfast, the Tinney sculpture in Noah's mother's hometown of Straban, Lagan Valley Island, Enniskillen Castle and the Struhl Arts Centre lit up in blue as part of the campaign seeking answers. In January 2021, they organised a car convoy in Belfast during lockdown, starting at the Blacks Road and travelling across the city to Stormont Estate, Northern Ireland's main parliament buildings, where blue ribbons were tied to the railings outside. Hundreds turned out in support. They've gathered an army, many of whom joined Noah's family in completing Noah's journey from the city centre to Cave Hill, the section he did not get to finish that day. The Belfast Telegraph reports... Police warned that those who took part risked being arrested and it resulted in the PSNI investigating potential breaches of COVID restrictions and parade legislation over the walk held in honour of Noah. There was uproar from the public. This line of investigation was dropped. Then in 2022, there was the controversial application for the PII for the inquest into Noah's death. And PIIs are common in investigations, but not in a case where it is alleged there was no foul play and no third party involvement, and certainly not relating to the death of a child. A protest of over a thousand people gathered in Belfast 
However, the PII was signed off on just days before the inquest was scheduled, further delaying it. This PII hides three files on the PSNI's investigation into Noah's death. This brought forth the Release the Files petition, which has over 300,000 signatures. This is a lot of public interest and support, but the PII remains in place. This PII, as I said, doesn't just hide one or two paragraphs, it hides 600 pages relating to Noah's investigation. But as with some of the other cases mentioned, Noah's family have also been targets of harassment, threats, and the Gardaí, the Irish police, just last year, 2023, turned up at an ex-partner's door in Dublin, an ex-partner of Neve, Noah's aunt, as there had been a missing person report filed on her. Of course, Neve wasn't missing. This was a typical intimidation tactic, basically saying this is what will happen if you continue. You will be the missing person. But it didn't stop her. She is continued. Nothing will stop Noah's family looking for answers, truthful answers, as to what really happened to Noah. What they have put up with since Noah's death is inhumane. It's from those in power and otherwise. Many politicians have come forward claiming to support with them to stand with Fiona, but they don't tend to stick around. The media blackout surrounding Noah's case speaks volumes. And fair play to Patricia Devlin for getting the news out there to the public. I will leave all the links in the description to Noah's social media support platforms and links to Noah's foundation. The last observation I will leave you with regarding the horrifying and truly devastating case of Noah Donoghue is that, to the best of my knowledge, no paramilitary group has officially claimed responsibility nor denied having any ties to Noah's death. Let's hope that the coroner's inquest with a jury will be the real start of justice for Noah. The Noah Donoghue Foundation This fund will offer grants supporting children and young people from all communities across Northern Ireland. The Noah Donoghue Music Fund will provide an annual bursary scheme to support the development of applicants with a particular talent in music and to financially assist their skills and help them develop their talent. Fiona Donoghue said, If we see one child in the future that had a talent but their parents couldn't afford a guitar, a cello, if that child gets what Noah got out of it, it would just be so beautiful. That is Noah living through them. He will live through their spirit. I would love someone to want to play the cello because they will have been inspired by Noah. If you'd like to leave a comment but you don't quite know what to say, which is understandable in Noah's case, just drop a blue heart in the comments and that will say enough. I would like to offer my support and my sincere and deepest condolences to Fiona, Neve and Noah's family. Thank you everyone for watching. Yeah,